Oliver, thank you very much for coming here today and giving me an opportunity to talk to you about your book. The book, A Delicate Matter, is about French art of the 18th century, the period that, in your own words, fundamentally altered the relationship between art, time, and value. At the heart of this transformation is the concept of delicacy that is associated with both personal refinement and material instability. Could you please talk more about these ideas and other ideas of the book? Thank you, Nina, for reading the book and for inviting me to do this conversation. I think it helps to say a little bit about how I arrived at the topic of the book. You know, I'm an art historian, but my undergraduate education was in studio art, primarily painting and printmaking. And that background still informs how I go about doing art historical research. Most of my research projects involve in some way artists' materials and techniques. And this project began about 10 years ago when I was struck by the prevalence of fragile and materially unstable works of art made by painters and sculptors in 18th century France. You can think here, for example, of um, pastel portraits. Pastel is a, a notoriously fragile medium, uh, vulnerable to, to touch and vibration, or small-scale terracotta sculpture, uh, which artists often exploited to demonstrate their handling of very fine forms that were quite fragile to handle. So the question at the start of the project was really why these types of objects became popular in 18th century France. And in the course of my research, it became clear that the reason for artists making these works and for collectors buying them really has to do with a transformation in the art market and the emergence of a consumer culture within 18th century France. Now, consumer culture supports the production of these fragile objects in a couple of ways. First off, a, a key factor is this idea of delicacy that you mentioned. Now, through the 17th century, delicacy had been understood as a, a personal attribute, a, a sensitivity to um, finely made um, objects, finely made um, experiences. Delicacy was a, an attribute of the, the person. This, this um, was really important within 17th century court culture. Um, so to be delicate was to be somebody who, who had a sensitivity to these, these subtle experiences. But the growth of consumer culture in the late 17th and early 18th centuries added this other form of delicacy in supporting the production of objects that materialized delicacy. So think about, for example, uh, lace cravats or uh, porcelain tea sets. And you actually see in the dictionary definitions of delicacy a transformation that occurs right around the beginning of the 18th century, where the idea of delicacy as a personal quality, a kind of sensitivity, now in the 18th century coexists with delicacy as this material quality, this, this fragility. And this, um, this was one way that the market supported the production of fragile objects. Now, the other way that the emergence of consumer culture supported the creation of ephem ephemeral commodities was this um, new temporality that we associate with fashion. So fashion prioritizes novelty and keeping up with um, what's, what's the latest trend. And it incentivizes, therefore, the creation of objects, not necessarily for their physical longevity. Um, you have makers of luxury objects who are uh, often sacrificing durability in the favor of making objects sometimes more cheaply and, and um, with less concern for their, their solidity. So consumer culture creates this tension 
in the idea of delicacy between, on the one hand, delicacy as this kind of highly refined um, sensibility, and then on the other hand, delicacy as the, the kind of debased, low fragility of, of the flimsy commercial product. And that tension creates particular problems for artists during this time, because artists, on the one hand, they, they need to make money, and so they need to participate in this economy that is moving towards more fragile objects. On the other hand, artists are very self-conscious about their image, and they don't want to be seen as um, lowly craftspeople. Artists had, for centuries, been working to elevate their status above the, the um, category of the mere um, tradesperson. And in the 18th century, what we find is artists trying to navigate these, these um, new conditions, trying, on the one hand, to capitalize on the commercial fascination with delicacy, but on the other hand, trying to avoid being accused of just making ephemeral commodities. While France wasn't the only country in the 18th century interested in fashion and consumer culture, French obsession with delicacy was distinctive, and that term social meaning became central to France's identity. Why France? Is this the time when France became the epitome of high culture and refined taste that remained so influential during the next two centuries and to a lesser extent exist today? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, because as you say, ephemeral consumption wasn't unique to France. 18th century England also saw a consumer revolution with increasing um, uh, desire for, for um, ephemeral commodities. However, the French preoccupation with delicacy is distinctive. And the reason for that really has to do with this context of court culture, where going back into the 17th century, delicacy had been central not only to um, a certain way of being within court society, but it was central to French identity, to the French self-conception as um, a nation that was devoted to um, uh, a certain a certain something, a je ne sais quoi, uh, uh, a type of sophistication and refinement that French people, particularly within the upper echelons of society, saw as distinctively French. And that wasn't just the French who, who uh, saw French, ident French identity as being tied to delicacy. You find English commentators from this time, for instance, the English poet, 17th century English poet, John Dryden, talks on several occasions about how delicacy is a key word um, by which the French distinguish themselves. So this helps explain why the commercialization of delicacy in, in fragile consumer goods becomes such a, a fraught issue within France, because the emergence of these ephemeral consumer goods threatened to degrade and debase something that was so central to French self-conception. Now, art, as I've said, was left in an uncertain position as a result of these changes, but art also provided in some ways a, a way of resolving this dilemma, because as artists sought to claim that the types of fragile objects they were making were different from other types of ephemeral consumer goods, they created a class of ephemeral commodities that was ostensibly purified, elevated above the, um, the mere flimsiness of, of any other um, disposable um, um, product. And this then, by the end of the 18th century offers a, a, a kind of redemption of delicacy, a, a way for France to maintain its self-conception as, as a, a place devoted 
to highly sophisticated ways of being. Um, even after the, the portly conception of delicacy starts to lose its relevance, art becomes um, a new vessel for this, uh, this understanding of France as, as a place uh, that is distinctively sensitive to, uh, to a, a fine way of creating a fine way of being. Um, I think to the extent that France is still thought of as uh, uh, a beacon of, uh, of artistic um, and cultural um, uh, achievement and, and uh, refinement, I think those associations go all the way back to the artists I'm talking about here in the 18th century. Can we say that 18th century pastelists were in a way predecessors of Impressionists, if not in materials, then in the attempts to grasp fleeting moments of life in the most visually effortless manner? Absolutely, I, I do. And in fact, actually, materially, too. You say maybe if not materially, but actually the material of pastel, the medium of pastel, actually has a revival in the hands of Impressionists. And after the medium uh, fell somewhat out of favor in the early 19th century, the Impressionists um, again adopted um, Degas, for example, uh, was uh, a master of pastel. Uh, I think your question also speaks to a broader issue, which is the extent to which some of the the cultural achievements of 19th century French artists, are they anticipated by what takes place in the 18th century? To what extent does the 18th century actually represent the origin of a lot of um, uh, forms of artistic creation and expression that we associate with, with more modern artists? And, that's actually a, a big focus of um, what I'm trying to do in, in the book, because I think for art historians who talk about the emergence of modern art, often that origin point is located in the middle of the 19th century. Um, for instance, if, if um, an art historian were um, to give a, a brief lecture about um, the beginnings of modern art, that art historian might start by citing Baudelaire's classic essay, The Painter of Modern Life, in which um, Baudelaire says that the essence of modernity is um, the transitory, the fleeting, the contingent. Uh, it's a mid-19th century essay, uh, really foundational for our conception of what makes modern art modern. And yet those qualities, the transitory, the fleeting, the contingent, those are absolutely qualities that define the pastelists in, in my book, that define the ceramicists in, in my book. Um, and I think part of what the book shows is that the, the things that we say define modern art can be found all the way back in the 18th century. And I think this goes beyond just starting the story earlier, saying, okay, let's um, begin the narrative in the 18th century rather than the 19th century. It's also about the causes behind um, artists taking up those qualities. So if you begin the story in the 19th century, you would typically say that that exploration of fleetingness comes with the emergence of a, a, an artistic avant-garde that rejects the traditions of the academy. Um, it's a, 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 a position of opposition to, um, to, to the canon, to tradition, um, to the institutions that had long governed art. But actually, in this 18th century context, we find that a lot of those qualities of of an engagement with 
fleetingness, transience, ephemerality, they come not so much from uh, an effort to um, attack um, tradition and, and artistic institutions, but they come really from the emergence of commercial modernity. They, they come from uh, the expansion of the art market and more generally, art being absorbed within the larger system of consumer capitalism. So this is a long way of answering your question about um, whether 18th century pastelists are connected to impressionists. But I think it gets at deeper issues, which is really where, where do those defining aspects of modern art, a preoccupation with the transient, the, the contingent, the ephemeral, where and when do they originate? And I'm making the case that you have to go back to um, the commercial conditions that governed 18th century art. What is the legacy of 18th century art in our days? And do its ideas continue to interest and intrigue contemporary artists? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a big legacy. And the, the fact that 18th century art still interests contemporary artists, in some ways that's not a, um, a novel insight. Art historians have long um, observed that there are contemporary artists who look back to uh, the Rococo for stylistic inspiration. Um, we might think here of um, an artist like Jeff Koons or, or um, Yinka Shonavare, um, whose work takes the aesthetic maximalism of, of the Rococo and, um, and stylistically explores it. For me, the legacy of 18th century art goes deeper than just style. It's really about the relationship between the market and the temporality of art. So it's really a structural transformation that is at the heart of the, the legacy of 18th century art. Um, all of the artists in my book have come to the realization over the course of the 18th century that transients can be commodified, that it's possible to, to take a precarious, ephemeral, unstable object and, uh, and, and make money off of it. Now, the idea that transients can be commodified, we know that that's something that contemporary artists are still very much aware of. I mean, performance artists, um, installation artists who work with decaying and, and ephemeral materials. That's very much present in our own time. But I think less commonly recognized is the way artists all the way back to the 18th century were exploring this idea. And a lot has changed from the 18th century to today. I mean, uh, uh, ephemeral performance or, or installation is made in a, in a very different context in many ways. I mean, this is now an age of the experience economy where um, people are trying to uh, escape the virtual lives of a, of a screen-mediated world and they want to go to ephemeral perf performances which they can then post on social media. Uh, so I don't mean to say that it's exactly the same as it was in the 18th century. But at a deeper level, many of the, the, the systemic factors that led to the creation of these unstable objects in the 18th century remain very much present. At the most basic level, artists are still competing in a competitive economy for public attention. And it's that, that temporal pressure that it puts on artists uh, the, the new temporal consciousness that emerges with consumer capitalism, that to me is the bigger legacy of 18th century art, one that we're still grappling with today.